what are the most important things that you need to know about quantum computing? As these computers we talk, start getting bigger and more robust and full tolerant, uh, we'll start to see impact on healthcare, life sciences. We'll start to see impact on clean technologies and storage. Hello and welcome to the Cyber News Channel. I'm Damian Black, your host for today. I'll be talking to Jack Hydery, CEO of Alphabet spin-off Sandbox AQ. Thanks for being here with us, Jack, and welcome to the show. When they are designed to be fault-free, quantum computers will be able to solve an unsolved problem instantly. Well, I wouldn't use the word instantly, but in very short amounts of time, and if we just modify the question to very short amount of time and we, we limit it to certain problems, then yes, there are certain problems that quantum computers, when they are scaled and fault tolerant, we say, or error corrected, uh, they will be able to solve certain problems in very, very short amounts of time that today would take long, long cycles. Now, what we're hearing about quantum computing is that it's just going to be so much faster than what we now call classical computers. Um, I mean, just in layman's terms again, are we talking about like quantum computing is like the sun and classical computing is like a single nuclear power station? I mean, what, what, just to put it in terms that, that a viewer yeah. can understand, what, what's the differential we're looking at here, Jack? You know, the, the difficulty is that it's not a speed up of all things. It's really a speed up only of very few things. So quantum computers can do very few things better, but the things they do better, once we get to scaled quantum computers, not the ones of today, but the ones of the future, they will do them exponentially better. If you had something as um, tall as a street light, and then you had something that was a spaceship, you know, in the in space, I mean, that's the differential. Here's the caveat. It's only for a handful of things. You would not get any more speed up of your Excel spreadsheet. You would not get any more speed up of, of a, a lot of traditional things that we all do every day. Um, it would not run your database really much faster in terms of what we're talking about. One thing to remember about quantum computers is that there's no hard drive, there's no memory. So we have to unite them, hybridize them with classical computers. And I'll tell you, the exciting thing about the birth of the new quantum computers today, the last few years and the next five to 10 years, is that they're being born on the cloud. The previous generations of hardware over the last 40 years, if we look at the history of IBM 360s, digital, Vax, uh, Sun, SGI, Dell, Lenovo, all these different revolutions in, in speed and power, the CPUs from Intel, AMD, NVIDIA. What we see is that the majority of those years when a new computing hardware paradigm came out, you had to buy that computer and then you ran it for a number of years until it became obsolete and then you replaced it with the next generation. That is a costly methodology and it means slow rate of replacement because you don't want to just buy it day one and then get rid of it day two. So cloud is is seeing that is a way around that, the, the reliance on cloud computing. Exactly. Now that we have the cloud and we already have CPUs in the cloud and GPUs in the cloud, now we're seeing the rise of QPUs in the cloud. Your workhorse, general workhorse chip, it's not optimized for any one particular task. It's good at a generic set of tasks. If you want to run an Excel spreadsheet, you want to run Microsoft Word, Google Docs, but when it comes to more specialized tasks such as playing video games and rendering real life, you know, lifelike uh, video games, or if, you, if you're Pixar and you want to uh, render huge amounts of uh, lifelike cartoons, or if you have certain calculations you want to do in neural networks, uh, these deep, deep learning neural networks with thousands and thousands of hidden layers. Uh, between the input and the output layer, then you want to use a specialized chip called the GPU, a graphical processing unit. The future of computing is not quantum or classical. It is quantum and classical, right? It's a hybridization of, of these different chips that do different things well. Right now, when a utility looks at solar and wind, they do not look at it the same way as other 
uh, generation sources because uh, they cannot necessarily depend on that sun being up or the wind blowing. Now, so they call those intermittent, intermittent power sources. In fact, if you then couple a solar panel array or a wind turbine with a battery system so that whenever the wind is blowing, it's pumping the electrons into the battery system. And now you have a base load. You have a consistent supply of electrons coming out of the battery system. Australia has installed a major grid-based uh, battery system in, um, and, and there'll be other battery systems installed around the world. But right now, there's very little storage of electrons on our grid today in the US. Fewer than 1% of the electrons are stored. But with the rise of better battery systems, we could store them. But what's holding that back? Probably what's holding that back is the cost and weight and the material used to make lithium ion batteries. We need to move beyond lithium ion. We need to think about new chemistries that do not use cobalt, that, that use um, different elements to make these batteries that are less costly uh, and uh, less weighty. And to do that, that is a quantum question. It's a quantum chemistry question. And quantum computers will be helpful in advancing those kinds of chemistries as well. As these computers become, start getting bigger and more robust and fault tolerant, uh, we'll start to see impact on healthcare, life sciences, We'll start to see impact on clean technologies and storage uh, in batteries. We'll start to see new materials that we can develop that might be better for cars and planes as stronger and lighter uh, materials. Um, so I think we're really in for a wonderful decade coming ahead of innovation. Quantum computers still need at least another five years to get to sure. uh, some base level maturity, but starting in about five years, quantum computers will start to really rock and roll. And we're, we're not waiting for quantum computers, right? So right now, the GPU arrays have gotten so big and so powerful. We are doing some of this new life sciences work, drug development work, battery chemistry work on arrays of GPUs. So we're not waiting. We can run the quantum equations on arrays of GPUs. And that's a very exciting development. We'll continue to do that. And then we'll add in the QPU when it becomes available. So we're looking at a synergistic effect of the GPU arrays, which are getting better and faster and more capable every six months, as well as the QPU as that begins to kick in as well. So it's a very exciting moment. To the NIST, there'll be post-quantum encryption standard will be finalized in two years. Is, is, is that really what we're looking at here? So it's already kind of baked in the sense that the past six years, NIST six years ago started a process with multiple stakeholders in academia, industry, other governments around the world. Uh, people from 25 countries participated in the NIST process starting six years ago. 82 initial submissions were given, 69 of those accepted in round one. That was culled down to 27. That was culled down to 15. This has been a series of cullings and validation processes with peer review thousands of people involved around the world. Um, this has been an open process. So, you know, it's not often every day, Damien, that we get to point to a governmental process that was open, inclusive, um, well thought out. This is one. July 5th was the date that NIST was able to then announce the standards that the protocols that would move forward and now uh, will be the standards. And so we're all very familiar with all these protocols. We've had years to engage with these protocols. And one of the winners that comes out of this is something called lattice-based cryptography. What is LBC? What is lattice-based cryptography? It will now replace RSA, you know, the main strain of encryption that we use for over the internet communication and other applications. 1978 is when we first started getting RSA encryption. And then in the 80s, it was, it was standardized and embodied. And we've been using it for 40 years now, and it's served the, you know, the, the world very well. In fact, it's very fair to say that the world economy, the global economy is built on and depends on public key encryption. Because without public key encryption, we couldn't transmit credit cards. We couldn't have e-commerce. We couldn't have banking transactions. We could not have confidential information stored for, as patient data. When we get scaled quantum computers, not the computers of today, but the ones coming up 
in a number of years, these quantum computers will be able to crack RSA encryption and other forms of encryption that we use today. This encryption is what we've built the world economy on. The governments of the world and led by NIST, uh, the United States Department of Commerce got together and said, we need a new set of standards because RSA and ECC, elliptic curve cryptography, are cracked by quantum, cracked. Um, and so you might ask, why switch now if the quantum computers that could do this are not yet here? And the answer is in four letters, SNDL, store now, decrypt later, meaning that there are adversaries out there who know that they'll have quantum computers in a number of years that will they will use to crack RSA. And what they do now is they siphon off information over the open internet as you're communicating, they just siphon it out, make copies of it. You are oblivious to that. You have no idea because your information is getting through, but they're making copies of that. They right. cannot read it now, but they can read it in a number of years. So they store it now and they decrypt it in the future. Do you think this could be hijacked by other state actors? Like, because you said it's an open and an inclusive process. I mean, is there not a danger that this could be, you know, it's escalation? It's up to each government now to begin to put directives out in terms of migrating the 20 billion devices. So my phone, your phone, there's 8 billion phones on this planet. They, You can keep the phone, Damien, but you have to upgrade the software on the phone. Every messaging app that you use, any viewer watching this who's using WhatsApp or Signal or uh, Telegram or any other app, yeah, uh, okay. those apps will have to be upgraded over the next year or two to the new quantum safe standards. It's going to be a big industry growing up out of this. Someone stands to make a, a fair amount of money out of this, right? Upgrading all our devices to be quantum resistant, friendly, call it what you want. Yeah, so there's a lot of work to be done. It'll be done uh, by many people. It'll be done by IT organizations internally. It'll be done by uh, various consultancies and systems integrators. It'll be built in by OEMs. So the routers and the phones of the future will come standard with this. They'll bake it in to the software that you, you get your phone with. So this is going to be a multi-party integration and upgrade. This is going to take years. It's going to take four or five years to move our, 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 our globe, our planet to uh, the new standards. The one thing I'll just leave with, leave you with is that uh, a recommendation to the audience who's viewing this today and listening to us today is not to be intimidated by the word quantum. If you want to change careers, if you want to get involved in, in AI or quantum in these very advanced areas, don't be intimidated. There are a lot of resources right now. This is the golden age. I mean, this is the golden age of online education. This is the moment that people can tap into this. There's online courses, there's books, uh, there's videos on YouTube. This is the moment to tap into that uh, and start to learn more about this. Whether you want to be a sales executive or marketing executive in this area, you want to be an engineer, an innovator, a scientist, there are ample, ample opportunities. You don't need a background in hardcore maths or sciences, no. for no, example. No, you develop all that now with online tools. And so this is a moment for people to consider adding this to their skill set. Uh, we need more people in the industry. There's a shortage of people already. Uh, even though it's a young industry, there's already a shortage of people. So I would strongly encourage those viewing and listening today uh, to not be intimidated by the terminology in the field. Uh, there's more and more accessible resources every day that are launched on the internet. So we welcome you to the field. Well, that's all for today, folks. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this video and enjoyed the topic, please check our YouTube channel where we have a quantum computer explainer video. And if you'd like to subscribe to the channel, just click on the button and we'll see you again soon.